So welcome to Practical C++ 17. So my name is Jason Turner. I am the co-host of CppCast and host of C++ Weekly. That's my YouTube channel. Have you heard of C++ Weekly and CppCast? Hey, a few people have, OK. Um, and co-creator of ChaiScript. And I mention that not because I'm trying to sell you on ChaiScript, but because I use it for a lot of examples for what I've learned and how I prove my best practices and stuff. And uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP also. I am an independent contractor and trainer, and I'm available if anyone's interested. That's how you can get in contact with me. So ChaiScript is my embedded scripting engine, the code developed by myself and my cousin, uh, designed specifically for embedding in C++. It supports Visual Studio, Clang, and GCC, and runs on Windows, Linux, Mac OS, FreeBSD, and Haiku. And Haiku's pretty esoteric, I'm guessing. No one uses Haiku here. I like this look. I'm getting a look here that's saying, I've heard of Haiku, but why did you put it on that slide? <laughs> is, that, is that a fair estimation? <laughs> so uh, it currently requires C++14, but part of the point of this talk is that I'm moving it to C++17. It's designed for integration with C++. And um, one, one thing that's worth pointing out here is that all the types in ChaiScript and in C++ are directly shared. So double and string function, if you pass one into ChaiScript or back into C++, they all stay the same. So like I said, this is my proving ground for my best practices. It's about 25,000 lines of code, and I mention that because I think this is the right size that I can keep most of it in my head, and I can comb through all the code, and I can apply best practices, and I can apply things to it. Uh, it has evolved from a library that started as C++03 with Boost into C++11 and 14 and again 17. And I've got lots of complex template uh, usage for type deduction. So this is a, a complete ChaiScript example. It's up here just because people always ask me what it is. That's what it looks like. You can declare your function greet, and then on line 9, you can expose your function to the ChaiScript engine, and line 10, just call it like that, and that should print hello, Jason. It's pretty straightforward. So a little bit about my talks. I would like to say move to the front, but you guys already did a great job of not sitting only in the back. Thank you. You can give yourselves a hand. <laughs> And please interrupt me and ask questions. That's how my talks work. So I expect people to yell stuff at me. You can raise your hand if you want to. If I don't see it, you can still yell something at me. That's fine. Now, just a quick comment. Um, Jens already mentioned Slack. Is everyone involved in their local C++ users group? Come on. No, all right. Who has a local users group and they're not going to it? <laughs> Who's going to admit it? OK, that's what, like a quarter of the people here almost. Go to your local users group meeting, get involved. There's Twitter, there's Slack, there's, um, I don't know, yell out other things. We, we, what's that? Meetups. Yeah, your local meetups. Um, yeah, stay involved. So I'm going to give an overview of C++ 17 features that I used, this is not a complete um, all C++ 17 features by any means. That's a much longer talk, which Bryce Lelbach gave at CppCon and is already up on YouTube. If you want to see that full talk on all the features, you can watch his. This is features that I thought were interesting to talk about. So I, I guess before I continue, is anyone actually able to use C++17 in their code base today? Not bad. What compilers are you using? GCC7? Visual Studio. So you're, you're on the latest, yeah. what? 15.4. Oh, I thought last I looked, three. I've been traveling for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, OK. So, so you've got a fair number of C++ 17 features with Visual Studio 15.4, and probably someone on Clang 5 or something here. OK, cool. Very good. So this is what a structured binding looks like. It can be used to automatically split a structure into multiple variables, like that. It's a combination of built-in C++ language feature and library support, so you can uh, expose your own types to be able to work with structured bindings. 
It works with C style arrays, simple classes and structs that have all public data members, and all the fixed size containers in C17 have uh, structured binding support. And I say fixed size containers, um, that's tuple and array, and I guess I left out pair. That's the only three things that I even need to mention here, isn't it? There's no other fixed size container, right? I don't think so. OK. And now, uh, if and it expressions. Uh, those of you using C17, are you using these features? Like this? You can uh, specify, you can give an initialization to occur before your conditional and your if statement. So are we familiar with this? Have, has everyone seen this stuff? Yes? OK. Um, so that works for if, and it works for switch statements. And this is the question that everyone wants to ask, so I just went ahead and answered it preemptively. Yes, the declaration that you make at the beginning of your infinite expression is visible to the else block also. So these features that I'm giving are in no particular order, just a high-level overview, like I said, of things that I thought were interesting. There's a bunch of standard library changes that occurred. Uh, the first one that I want to call out is in place back. This is like the tiniest, simplest little change, but it's one of my favorite in the standard library. So now in place back and in place front on our, um, uh, what's the classification of container? I can't think of at the moment. So for, well, for containers that have in place back and in place front, they now return a reference to the object that was created instead of returning void. So it's like a really trivial thing, but it kind of follows along with the uh, mindset of the standard library right now to say, if something has already been calculated and it's possible to return it, then let's go ahead and return it. So they were able to do this in a non-breaking change kind of way. Oops. What is going on? Sorry. OK. We covered infinite expressions, right? Somehow I passed over string view. I don't know how that's possible. OK. So string view was also added in the standard library here. Um, it is a lightweight wrapper around string-like things. So it gives an interface similar to standard string and can be constructed from a const car star, which I like to point out here, it may require a call to standard string length underneath the covers here to actually calculate the length of the string that was passed in, because a string view is a, is a pointer with a length, effectively. And we, you can also create it from a standard string. And I'm going to stop using this so I stop getting myself in trouble. There we go. So nested namespaces, we can now do this in C17. Yeah, ooh, right? <laughs> <laughs> Such a silly thing, but it's so much fun. <clears throat> OK, so those of you that have worked with uh, C17, are you taking advantage of class template type deduction? Vittorio is. <laughs> and a couple other hands came up. So this is effectively what class template type deduction gives you. I've implemented, and this is such a huge stage with a giant screen, and I make the cameraman work harder. I've implemented my own simple standard uh, pair implementation here. And I'm just able to demonstrate that I don't have to specify the types of the template parameters for my pair struct. I can just implicitly uh, infer them here from the types that were passed in. So that is a pair of int and double. Make sense? So C17, to make this work, also had to add something called template deduction guides. 
So this is the general form of a deduction guide. And the point is, with a regular class template, um, it can only deduce, let's go back, it can only deduce the types of the, the template type parameters if it can get that from the parameters that are passed to the constructor. So in this constructor, the first is first, and the second is second, and there's nothing confusing going on. Those are the two types that are part of the class template. And skipping ahead to this slide, I've now made a more complicated constructor for my pair, cli uh, pair class that takes two parameters by forwarding reference. So these can be anything. So we need to add a deduction guide. So on lines 12 and 13, this is the deduction guide saying, whatever you pass into me, I want you to decay it. And then I want that to be the template parameters. And you can do, has, has it been proven, I think, that we have yet another Turing complete feature of the language with deduction guides? As <laughs> I think that has been proven now. OK, if const expr, using if const expr yet? <coughs> Few people are. Compile time conditional block. If the constant expression that is evaluated in the if block is true, then the first block is compiled, else the second block is compiled. Now, this doesn't mean that you can put whatever gobbledygook you want to in there. They have to be things that are syntactic syntactically correct and uh, things that could pl possibly compile if it was a type that supported those, um, the operations on it. Fold expressions? Who's excited for fold expressions? A few people are. All right. So fold expressions come in four forms, unary left fold, unary right fold, binary left fold, binary right fold, and, well, these are all of the operations that you can fold over. And now, this is a topic for a completely different talk, but I would like to point out the last two. Does everyone see what those are? That is the uh, invoking a function pointer on an object. If someone can find out a way to use a fold expression with those operators that actually makes sense, send me an email. <laughs> I tried for a while. I think Jackie tried also, too. I remember having a conversation with her. Neither one of us could come up with anything useful here. So unary left fold, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so it's, it's the dots are on the left, so it is grouping to the left, so it's going to evaluate arg1 and arg2, and then it's going to evaluate that with arg3 and that with arg4. You put the dots on the right, it becomes a right fold, and now the grouping happens on the right with the expansion. And now the binary folds let you put some sort of initialization in here. So this is completely gratuitous to say true and whatever because, well, that's just going to get compiled away. These make sense so far? And binary right fold is the same deal, but you have the initialization on the right. OK, any questions before we move on? I'm going to, well, I mean, I'm just moving on to the next section, but does anyone have any comments or questions? <coughs> OK, like I said, we're keeping this as an overview of these features for the moment. So no except is now part of the type system. I like no except. I just did a talk on it. You should go watch it on YouTube. <laughs> uh, it's, it was at Pacific Plus Plus, which was last week, which is, at the moment, the newest conference in the C++ community. It was held in Christchurch, New Zealand. So we should, uh, you should go to it next year, because everyone needs to take a trip to New Zealand to go to a C++ conference. I mean, we all have to agree that the opportunity to go to New Zealand for a, piece of, for a C++ conference is a good plan, right? <laughs> all right. So no except is now part of the type signature of a function. And this code, the top block, 
can compile in C++ um, 14, but cannot compile in C++ 17. As far as I know, this is the only breaking change in C++ 17, and I haven't heard anyone else mention it as a breaking change to the language, but it can break existing code. So in C++ 17, you have to add, in my second code block, an overload that does not have a no except specifier on the function pointer that is being passed in. But you can, so you can drop no except, but you cannot add no except, because adding no except is a, is a stronger restriction. Is this, do you have a question? Okay. That's a quizzical look on your face, and no one's yelling at me, so. Uh, um, this is make sense? All right. So now th that was the introduction, and I took an introductory amount of time getting there. Now we're going to talk about what actual impact these had. Now, last time I gave this talk, I attempted to do a poll and have everyone actually do a web poll on this. But these are the things that we just talked about. And the question is, what is the impact of these things on my code when I applied it to ChaiScript? So first, we need to discuss what do we mean by impact. So what, what's like you know code readability? Yes. What's that? Performance. performance. Both compile time and runtime performance, perhaps. Um, the number of times you used it. That's an interesting point. I didn't consider that. So if it was like this spectacular thing, but I had exactly one application for it, how important was it really? OK. Um, code maintainability. Does anyone want to argue whether or not readability and maintainability are actually two different things? Tonight in the pub. Um, <laughs> we'll see about that. OK, so does anyone uh, want to go out there and throw out what do you think would probably has the most impact on my code base? And this will be great for those of you who are actually using C17 currently. If constexpr is a vote for the most impactful. If in it. What's that? If in it. If in it, OK. String view, all right? So uh, let's take one more person who has an idea. What's that? Structured bindings. OK, so who all says, let's see, we started with if const expert, I think. Who says if const expert is the most impactful? Oh, I don't think you're going to win there. OK, and then um, let's see, string view came up. Who says string view is the most impactful? A bit more. If init expressions? Uh, that's only like three votes. Sorry. <laughs> and then what was the last one? That structured bindings, I think, was someone's vote. OK, we get, all right, uh, that was, I don't know, 20-ish people or so. I think if I added that up, not all of you voted. <laughs> that's all right. So I'm going to reveal them in the order of least to greatest as far as how I thought they were. So if you thought no except in the type system was the most important thing, you'd be wrong. No except effectively. So I mentioned that ChaiScript has lots of templates for automatically deducing the types of functions that are passed to it. This is huge for me. It effectively caused a two times duplication of all of my um, of all of my de de template deduction, function deductions. Um, I think the microphone is rubbing in my beard a little bit. And uh, I then had to use feature macros to be able to still support C++14. So I had to have a feature macro to detect if the compiler supported no except in the type, de type system. And then I had to have a two times duplication of all of my um, overloads for deducing function template types, function parameter types, excuse me. Um, but this last bullet point, 
If I make two builds of ChiScript, one of them with C++14 enabled and one of them with C++17 enabled, this should be the only difference that comes into play. And now I see a 1% performance improvement in ChiScript runtime, which I can only attribute to the compiler being able to do smarter things with knowing whether or not functions are no except. Yes. I'm positive it's not noise, because I'm measuring operations executed, not time. So it's entirely possible that it's actually a less efficient build that executes in fewer instructions, because I know if it's getting less efficient pipelining or something. But it is clearly doing something. Oh, yeah, what's that? Could it be the new rules for PR values? I have no idea. Could it be moving, avoid, uh, avoiding move constructor calls because of the new rules for PR values? I don't know. We might have to talk about that later. Am I doing a good enough job repeating the questions? Thanks. <laughs> so I, um, I actually gave each of these things a rank. Um, and so. The score for this one, I, like, I, I, I don't even remember how I gave them scores. So, But I added them up in a spreadsheet, and this was the answer. <laughs> this is negative 0.5 on my score of usability in this. So minor performance improvement, plausibly, anyhow. Um, negative maintainability, because I've got conditional code, I've got more overloads, I've got no compile time difference observed, and no readability difference improved. All right, so what's going to be next? Some of you are definitely going to be disappointed. Yeah. So I was really excited. I really, I really was excited about different expressions. It is like, to me, almost the most exciting feature of C++17, because I love reducing variable scope. This gives me another tool for reducing variable scope. Um, but it turns out in my code that most of my functions are actually pretty small and well organized. So this was my gain. <laughs> OK. What's that? It's incredible. Well, and then, then I kept coming back to this. Every time I went to apply it, I would say, how in the world do I format it? <laughs> and I'm just like, like every, like literally every time, like, oh, should this be on one line or two? <laughs> so who says it should be on one line? Yeah, that's uh, the response I expected. But I still, oh, OK. For the sake of the camera, everyone raised their hand. <laughs> Clank, yes, Clank, I don't, does Clank Format have rules for this yet? It, it probably will soon if it doesn't already. You should add it and submit a patch. Let's be involved in the C++ community. Um, yeah. So I said it had no performance impact. Now, theoretically, it could. If this did actually help you reduce the scope of your vari variables in a meaningful way, then it could help the compiler reason about the lifetime of your objects. It could have a performance impact in helping the compiler generate better code. Um, bit a bit of a main maintainability. And this is where I have you know, this discussion of whether or not maintainability and readability are two different things. I feel like infinite expressions hurt readability in many cases, because we're not used to them yet. When I'm going back and I'm reading this top version, I'm like, wait, why is there a semicolon in the middle of my if statement? Yes? Yes?
So, so if you have something that can be implicitly converted to a bool that you are returning in your init expression, then this can actually have a really useful impact in the readability of the code. OK, cool. But um, I, oh, I was, by the way, I'm not trying to actually argue that this is not readable. I'm just trying to say that we're not used to reading it yet. We're getting used to this. So I gave this a 0.5 disappointing. Uh, oh, I nested namespaces. I don't think anyone voted for that as being their favorite feature that they thought would actually impact my code. But I got, um, you know, this is really gratifying. <laughs> and I, I have this thing that I know most people don't do, but I like to indent all my namespaces. And I know a lot of things, a lot of coding standards have them all flat on the side. So this was nice. Um, I found it really satisfying. Uh, I think the main problem, though, that we might find is when we're porting our code base from 14 or 11 to 17, and we go to imply this, it's possible we're going to get tons of white space diffs when we go to do our commits, depending on how your current coding standard is written. And then, what? <laughs> Comment? No? OK. Uh, so if you're like me and you don't have, you know, and you have it indented like this, a question that you have is, what happens if I want to add something to the ChiScript namespace right here after I've gone and reformatted it to this? You just have a question that you're going to have to answer for yourself in your coding base. Do I split it back up again? Do I just add a new namespace ChiScript above this? Whatever. There's going to be questions. Um, so, you know, maintainability, I argued this is plausibly negative. Readability was a uh, large impact, though I liked it, and really gratifying to use. So I think the next thing up we got votes for, class template type deduction. A few number of people said that, right? I think so. So as we said, we showed what class template deduction can do. The standard library adds support for this across the, the library. So I have the question of what impact did this actually have on my existing code base? That's the whole point of this talk. Uh, my answer is almost zero. Um, and I think, I know other people, you're using class template type deduction. So I'm going to put up my examples here. You can argue back with me in them if you'd like. If I've got my vector that's declared at class scope, I cannot use class template type deduction here, right? Because there's no meaningful way to. I can't initialize it with anything here. I have to just give it its type. It's a vector event, hypothetically, vector of whatever. So OK. Stood function, it now has template type deduction, which is cool. But just to make sure we're all on the same page, which one of these two choices is better in every possible way compared to the other one? A, we're all saying A is better. Does anyone want to clarify why? Because of inlining? That's a very, very succinct way of saying we're not generating reams and reams of code here that the compiler then has to try to optimize. Std function is not trivial and compounded if we were playing with bind or something. Oops, sorry. Does anyone think that either of these is a good use of template type deduction? Let's see. Um, I know a few people in the room, but not, not everyone for sure. So I'm going to pick on someone who thinks that this is not bad. Anyone? Come on. Is anyone going to defend? 
Like, no one's, okay. I'm really, I'm, I'm waiting here until someone gives me something. Yes, what? What's that, a standard vector of unique pointer? Oh, no, no, no. I, okay, so I'm not saying which one is better, if I'm, if I'm understanding your, your comment. I'm saying who thinks either of these is an acceptable thing to write in your code? It's acceptable, but doesn't buy you anything. Okay. 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 So the the comment was, if I saw this in a code review, I wouldn't mind. Yes. You're a little bit too far away for me to hear you. I'm sorry. Okay. So it's kind of like auto if you passed in a car star there, it wouldn't compile. Okay. All right. All right. I um I need to not run out of time. No, I'm good. Okay. The second code block can't compile. And everyone who doesn't know why, this is my sales pitch, my only sales pitch of the talk. If you don't know why, you need to hire me to come to your company to give training. But I'll explain why here. Does, does anyone know why the second code block can't compile? The, because there's a co oh, ha! <laughs> uh, the answer was because there's one extra comma, and that would be on line four, and that is correct, but that is not the answer I'm going for. Initializer list can't move. This is creating an initializer list that is a const array that is created for you, that is hidden by the compiler, that lives above your code block here. There's an array created. And then the initializer list is a pointer into that const array. And we're trying to initialize these vectors of objects by copy. So the top block is making a bunch of unnecessary copies of intentionally strings that do not fit within the small string optimization. And the second code block is trying to make copies of unique pointers, which is completely something that we can't do. We all know that we can't make copies of unique pointers, right? OK. So this is why in my world in practical code, like I just didn't end up finding a use for a class template type deduction, because all my use cases are either auto takes care of it, it's at the class level, or it doesn't gain me anything. But I know that that is, that's you know, not necessarily the, the experience through the room here. Yes, it's initializer, uh, initializer list fault. It's not class template type deductions fault. However, it affects our ability to meaningfully use class, temp class template type deduction with standard containers. Yes? Uh, what, about the, what about the fact that it removes the noise and has to create big functions? It removes the noise that you have to create and make functions for everything. I, th I think auto return types in C14 are more important for that than class template type deduction. Yes? You have to be what? You have to in line. That's true, but this is a header only library, so I'm kind of cheating. Vittorio says he makes a deduction guide when he would have instead made a make function. And uh, yes, and not relevant to this talk, but I will also say that I have made deduction guides when playing around, I haven't deployed this yet, in place of constructors altogether. That's really neat use cases for deduction guides. But just for the record, this isn't about deduction guides, this is about deduction. I had those as two separate bullet points. So structured bindings is next on my list. 
Oh, let's get back to this. I said possibly negative performance, um, score of 1.5 on my uh, um, opaque scoring standard. Structured bindings are cool. They let us do this. This is better, right? Um, we don't have to have this like obtuse like v dot first and v dot second or whatever. We can we can actually know what these things are. They're the name and our type. And these are this is like real code from ChiScript, effectively. So this. Structured bindings with um, ranged for loops. This is good stuff. Nice combination. The question is, is there any performance impact? Does anyone think there might be any performance impact? No, probably not. OK. Which one of these two options is better? Let's pretend that I have A and B there, because I do have A and B there, but I forgot to display the most recent build of my slides. So let's start with anyone saying which one's better. Yes? Return, get some value. Uh, no, OK, we, we have to assume that there's something more complicated going on here for the sake of this example. So this comment was, it's the same because return values are automatically moved by returning by value. Yes? Yes. RVO cannot be used in the second. That is the answer I'm looking for. So the first one is much better because the compiler can optimize it with return value optimization or move elision or copy elision or whatever you feel like calling it at the moment. The second one, we break return value optimization. And this generates significantly more code. I don't have the slides to prove that, but I definitely can. So we've established that we want the compiler to do its job. We want it to optimize the return value. We don't want to call standard move unless we have a reason to, basically. So then this raises this question of, which of these two choices is better? Yes. The second one. Yes. Why? Right. And the, the, the um, RVO can't work because we're returning a sub object, effectively. Yes. Oh, oh, wait, I thought, yes. Why wouldn't you want to move the pair and then close the parentheses by calling the RVO? Stood move pair and then close. Then close the bracket. Then close the bracket and call dot second. Um, Isn't that an extremely complicated subclass? I mean, maybe you could better explain it in terms of the other classes that you have to deal with. But that seems like a very confusing idea. Right. Uh, yeah, so calling move on the thing and then do that second, that's, that's a good point. Um, but uh, I'm building to something here. <laughs> so, but for the sake of this, the, what, what you're saying is effectively the same thing as what I'm doing. I mean, it would accomplish the same thing as from the compiler's standpoint. Yeah. So RVO can't, uh, named return value optimization can't apply to the sub-object. Sub OK, so now we are using structured bindings. Which option is better? Everyone agrees that the first one is better, right? No, OK. Who doesn't agree? Only one person? You haven't said anything yet, huh? Why don't you agree? It's also a sub-object. RVO cannot apply to a sub-object. So this is effectively what the compiler's done for you. I use E here because that's what the standard says. It creates a mythical object called E that is the return value from your function. And then 
it creates references into that thing, and then we're trying to return it. So we're trying to return a reference to a subobject effectively here. As I hear rumbling and mumbling. Does anyone want to? It's misleading, isn't it? It makes me sad. So potentially very negative. As far as I know, this is the only case in the language where you have to consider the source of a variable to know what the actual, um, the best thing to do with it is. So potentially very negative impact on performance, minor maintainability impact, readability can be huge. And these examples where we know we just want to unpack something, a reference to the things that we have in like a ranged for loop or something, this can be great. But we need to be aware of the lifetime of these things now. Uh, so I gave it a two still. So I still say it's all right, but it messes with our understanding of object lifetime. And object lifetime is something that I care a lot about. Um, yeah. So next up, I've got fold expressions. And I've, I need to start moving faster. Okie doke. So I, uh, OK, my problem with fold expressions is that I was already using the initializer list trick to emulate fold expressions. Have we all seen the initializer list trick? No? No? No, we haven't. Well, that's what it looks like. Um, so the first part is the initializer list. We're just expanding the things inside our initializer list, calling these functions. And here I'm doing a write fold with a comma operator expansion uh, on the bottom one, that is. So um, I'm going to skip over this slide for the sake of time. It's all right. It wasn't that important. So this is basically what my code looks like now. Uh, I did get rid of the initializer list trick. Oh, for those of you who haven't heard of the initializer list trick, I do have some C++ weekly videos around that stuff. So it's, they're pretty early, and you can check them out on YouTube. Um, I found myself looking at this code after I wrote it. And with a quick glance with my eyes, uh, skimming through the code, I look at line four and I go, why are there some parentheses and dots there? Like, because the point of the fold expression in my particular case is to invoke a bunch of function objects effectively. Uh, and I find that this, like for this particular case, I think it, it might obscure readability a bit. I'm not saying that this is better, that the, or, uh, yeah, that the initializer list version is better. But just saying, it's taking some time for us to get used to. So small maintainability impact, small readability impact, no compile time, no performance. But it had no negatives, really. So I said that this was a two also. In place back is next. I have this function. This is real code. I know that it's a lot of words on here. What I should draw your attention to is line of 14 and 15. I am calling in place back, then I am returning the thing that I just added. It becomes this. It's like the smallest change ever. Like if you got like a pull request, you're like, oh, okay, click, accept. <laughs> the thing is, I was actually able to measure a very tiny performance impact in this because I didn't have to reference that last item that I just added in the code. So um, I really like the fact that in place back is returning a reference now. Do a quick time check. I got 10 minutes, right? Approximately? Okay. Oops. So next up on my list, I have string view. Um, so the main impact of string view is in avoiding temporary strings, but it has a cost. So we already mentioned this, but let's really quick clarify what does the string view constructor need to do? Call string line. Call string line. OK. 
Um, must calculate the length of the string. Yes. It might do it at compile time, which interestingly brings up the point that there's the most recent build of GCC, most recent release of GCC still has bugs in its string view implementation where string lane is not const expert enabled, therefore it can't actually construct a string view in a const expert context from a const car uh, string literal. Anyhow, so this is my. Um, this is my chart of what we need to be aware of now. Strings can automatically be converted to string views via a conversion operator. Const car stars can automatically convert to a string via a non-explicit constructor. To me, this is one of the biggest mistakes in the standard library, that we can implicitly convert a const car star to a standard string. I'm getting nods. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad people are agreeing with me. Um, const car stars can automatically be converted to string views also also via a non-explicit constructor, but at least this doesn't allocate anything. So I'm mostly OK with that. And we've got our conversion operator, excuse me, we've got our comparison operators that compare string to string and string view to string view. So if one were to compare a string to a string view, one of them must be implicitly converted to the other for the comparison operator to work, which it does work because we know that we have an implicit conversion from string to string view. And then we would get the string view, string view version executed. So is this code OK? I have a map of a string view to an int, and I am looking up a key by a string. Do, no? It, does it compile? Let's start there. Yes, it compiles. So why is it bad? Lifetime. Because I am creating a string view to a potentially temporary string object, and then I'm possibly storing that in the map. So this is silent. This compiles without any warnings, and oops, we have a possible temporary pointer to temporary stored in our map. So map of string view is really risky. Don't do it. But that brings up the question of, does this compile? With this, we've flipped it around. We have a map of string, and we're looking up the key by string view. And I'm using the dot at call here intentionally. I'm sorry, what? I need what? Oh, uh, yes. So the point is we can't, um, there's no automatic conversion from a string view to a string, so this can't compile. So we must add a transparent comparator. That's what you said, right? OK. So if you add your own transparent comparator, and I am going to attempt to use my, ooh, it works. This is what I've done here on line one. I'm using std less with its uh, no template parameter version. And this now compiles and works. Uh, don't have time to go into what a transparent comparator is, but it looks like this. No. Um, it does work, but the point is that a temporary string view is needed for each comparison that has to to be executed. So it has to implicitly convert the string to a string view. And how can we do better? I have implemented my own version of less that, uh, no, I'm sorry. Let me step back. This is the version from, from the standard library. It takes two templated parameters by const reference, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and it does a less than comparison on them by whatever means is possible. And it defines this is transparent, which lets the map know that it has transparent comparators available. So I ended up making my version that looks like this, that can take a string and a string, so that's the best case, or it can take two things that are um, template parameters and does lexicographical compare on them using the standard algorithm. And this avoids having to create the standard, the uh, string view. Now, this might seem trivial, but 
I, and I will absolutely guarantee this is highly dependent on which particular compiler and which standard library you're using, but implementing my own less than transparent comparator was a 2% savings on the system. This is huge for me. So my point is, string view is awesome, but you need to be aware of it. And don't do this, um, well, or, well, let's, let's get to the worst case one. Don't do this. So I have my, my um, factory function called makeS. It takes a string. I'm moving that into my struct, which is a string view. So it is uh, creating the string view. And then I am moving that into my string. So I've done how many string creations here? Like four or five or something, potentially three or four, that is. Um, and I have in parentheses, not actually contrived. This is true. This happened during the refactoring of ChiScript's parser to using string view. I realized that I had multiple layers of string to string view to string to string view uh, conversions. So these implicit conversions are something that we should be aware of. Um, so the performance can be large in a good or bad way, depending on uh, what you do. Uh, I did not mention, but I should do a shout out to remove prefix that can actually be really helpful because it really helps with parsing. Um, and I think that the readability is actually helped here. So I gave this a score of three. Uh, yes, we mentioned that stuff. I, am ap I apologize that I am moving slower than I expected to be. So if const expert is great, I was able to go from code that looks like this with Sven A to code that doesn't use Sven A. Who likes Sven A? <laughs> Good answer, everyone. But it did not eliminate 100% of my Sven A usage. Does anyone want to yell out why it did not? Right, yeah, you're not actually performing Sven A. So for things like constructors and things that have various mixed overloads, things where you actually need to remove an overload from the overload set, it doesn't work. So I played with trying to eliminate Sven A altogether in, in, in a version of any that I have in my own code, and I kind of ended up with something like this for my constructor that had multiple layers of Sven A to see if a thing was an R value reference or was const or is the same thing to choose the correct code path. Don't do this. Um, I don't like Sven A. I'm going to use stick with it for other things. Um, so I gave if const expert a five. It was helpful when you could use it. No real caveats, no gotchas. You weren't going to accidentally screw up your code base. Next up, I've got class template, type, uh, class template deduction guides. So I used to have um, these overloads that I was discussing at the beginning with no except being added to the type system. I know this is it's a lot of stuff on there, but this is uh, functions for deducing the types of functions that are passed into ChiScript. So I used to have this. I was able to replace it with a set of deduction guides. And these deduction guides are awesome. You can actually, if anyone's curious about these, you can send me an email, and I can show you where I actually implemented them in my code base. So the net result for me was no change in lines of code, but I got eight times better support for C++ function overloads, because now I can support reference qualified methods, and I can support volatile methods in a much easier way with this kind of peeling off the types using deduction guides. I said this was a huge help. It didn't help me with, um, it helped with compile time a little bit, but in a performance a little bit, but not huge. So these are uh, my conclusions, and I'm finishing two minutes late. Um, I want a shout out to maybe unused here. I uh, didn't mention it before. Uh, that helps. Like it is, you guys, uh, you, you've you've had to cast a variable to void at some point to silence the compiler. I think probably. Um, 
maybe unused gets around that. There are many const expert changes I didn't address. Um, these things with being able to do decay, uh, like is trivially destructible underscore v, those are really helpful. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to uh, no discard, which, um, which well, eh, should have put a slide in on that. Anyhow, sorry I'm a little over time. This is me. Thank you, everyone. If you have any questions, yell them out, or feel free to go, because we're out of time. Thank you. I'll still be here, so whatever. Yeah. Any questions? Why isn't there not a reference? Why is there not an overload for the string view constructor that takes a reference to a const car array? That is a great question that I've been asking also. I didn't. There is not one. I am positive. Yes. All right. Thank you.